For science class, let's go over ocean water and ocean life. All right, let's talk about the composition of seawater. Um, by weight, it has 3.5% dissolved minerals in it. That's why it tastes horrible, okay? And what that is, uh, we refer to that as salinity, okay? So ocean water has dissolved solid material in it, okay? Um, we typically express it in parts per thousand, okay? Average salinity is about 35 parts per thousand. And what that means essentially is that if you have a liter of water, right, which is 1,000 milliliters, 35 of those milliliters or 35 grams would consist of dissolved solids or salts. So if you let that liter of water evaporate away, you'd be left behind with 35 grams, approximately 35 grams on average of uh, salt. All right, so here's that example. Here's a liter of water or a thousand grams of water. Milliliters and grams are kind of interchange interchangeable. And so this is on average open ocean seawater has about 35 grams of salt. Okay, now what <clears throat> that consists of is mostly chloride. Chloride is the most abundant ion uh, in seawater at about 55%. The next most abundant is sodium. And those two together form an ionic bond, and that creates NaCl, which is salt. Other major constituents uh, dissolved solids in seawater are sulfate, magnesium, calcium, potassium, and then here are some other minor constituents. So the source of all these dissolved solids are um, essentially rocks on land weathering away and those dissolved solids being kind of uh, carried into the ocean via rivers, glaciers. Um, and also at mid-ocean ridges where you have new ocean crust being created, seawater really interacts with those volcanic areas and a lot of dissolved solids are exchanged that way too. Now, there are processes that affect the seawater salinity and so there are variations in salinity uh, in our global oceans, okay? And that those are consequences of changes um, in the water content of uh, the water or in that environment. Some of the processes that affect uh, the seawater salinity, you know, either making the ocean saltier or less salty, okay? Um, these are the processes that decrease seawater salinity. So precipitation, rain or snow, any runoff from uh, of water from land, so fresh water going into the ocean. Icebergs melting delivers more fresh water to the ocean, lowering salinity. And then sea ice melts. Sea ice uh, forms in uh, really high latitudes where it gets cold enough that uh, the ocean f freezes essentially. And it's, it's uh, seawater um, the water in seawater freezes, so it doesn't include the dissolved solids. So the ice that forms as sea ice is pure water. So as it melts, it adds more fresh water into the ocean, so it lowers salinity. The only two processes that increase salinity are evaporation. So what evaporation is, is essentially uh, water molecules converting from the liquid phase to the vapor phase. And so that leaves behind the dissolved solids in the remaining water. Therefore, the remaining water is more salty. And then uh, when sea ice forms, so when you form sea ice, that removes fresh water from the oceans and locks it up as ice so that the remaining ocean water becomes saltier as a result. Okay, so because of those processes, um, surface salinity in the open ocean has a variation between 33 parts per thousand to 38 parts per thousand. Okay, here's a satellite image showing the uh, range in salinity in the ocean surface. So what you can see here is there are kind of salty zones, okay? Right along this latitude and this latitude north and south of the equator, these are evaporation latitudes. So there's more evaporation than precipitation here. And so as a result, the seawater here, the open ocean seawater is saltier than in other regions. At the equator, right here, you can see this is a bunch of blue. 
over here, blue and purple, this is low salinity. Anywhere in red and yellow, this is uh, high salinity. So at, at uh, the equator, um, you have a lot of precipitation. And so that precipitation leads to lower salinity seawater. And if you notice, there are some areas like right here. This is the runoff from the Amazon River. Here's the Mississippi River, kind of you see that little green area here. And then the Ganges River dumps a lot of fresh water into the Indian Ocean. And so that's why you see those kind of blue colors in that region. Ocean temperature varies as well, and it varies based on how much solar radiation is received. So lower surface temperatures in the open ocean are found at high latitudes. And what I mean by high latitudes are areas up here. These are high latitudes, okay? Now, I don't include, this only goes up to 40 degrees, um, but at high latitudes, you find cooler ocean temperatures, surface temperatures. When you go to low latitudes, so close to the equator, which is right here, um, that's where you find high temperatures. And essentially, the reason for that is because the low latitude areas, like the equator, they receive more solar radiation. So the ocean water heats up as a result. And then at high latitudes, uh, they receive less solar radiation, and therefore the ocean doesn't get as warm. Now, if we think about not just the surface of the ocean, but if we go down uh, in depth, so if you were floating on the surface of the ocean and you dive down and go to deeper and deeper waters, um, there are temperature variations when compared to the surface and as you go into deeper and deeper waters. So if you're at low latitudes, like at the equator, you usually have high temperature at the surface, and we talked about that already. And so what happens is when, when you go into deeper and deeper water, there's a rapid decrease in temperature with depth, okay? And that leads to uh, that rapid change in temperature. We refer to it as a thermocline. At high latitudes, um, the, there's very cold water at the surface. And as you go underneath the surface to deeper and deeper waters, there really is no rapid change in temperature. So if we look at a graph, here are low latitudes, right? This graph shows us on the x-axis temperature, okay, from zero degrees Celsius to 24 degrees Celsius. So zero is freezing, okay? And then here's depth. So if you go in this direction, you're going into deeper and deeper waters. So this here is the surface of the ocean. So on the surface at low latitudes, it's really hot. On average, 23 degrees Celsius. And the temperature remains quite stable uh, up until about 100 meters, then there's a drastic decrease in temperature. You see this decrease in temperature, and then it kind of levels off right around one kilometer or 1,000 meters. Uh, the temperature levels off to about two to three degrees, and then it kind of remains uh, that temperature once you get to two kilometers of depth and eventually to three kilometers of depth. So this area here where there's a rapid decrease in temperature, we refer to this layer as the thermocline. All right. At high latitudes, we have a different story. Okay. Um, on the surface, uh, the sea surface at high latitudes, uh, the temperature is about three degrees Celsius, and that temperature doesn't change as you go into deeper and deeper waters. One kilometer, then two kilometers, then three kilometers. So there is no thermocline. Thermocline is absent. We refer to this temperature profile as isothermal. Okay. Ocean temperature uh, changes over time. Um, since the Industrial Revolution, we've seen uh, our oceans warm up because we're putting a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere as a result of burning fossil fuels, and that traps more heat in the atmosphere. And as a result, it heats up the water beneath the atmosphere, our oceans. But our oceans uh, do a really good job of regulating the temperature because the oceans have high heat capacity. It's kind of a, a unique thermal property. Ocean water uh, resists drastic temperature changes. But despite that fact, global warming is still influencing ocean temperatures. Here you can see this is a GIF showing us uh, uh, 2017, so two years ago, was the third warmest uh, year on record. Okay, and then here shows you uh, down here uh, all these plots 
our um, global temperature uh, recaps of those years. And as you can see from 1976 today, we can see a steady increase um, in uh, global temperatures. Uh, so this is more recent, 2015 and up. And so that's, uh, that, that's alarming. Here, this graph shows us latitude versus temperature and salinity. And so this just drives home the point. So as far as temperature goes, this is the equator, zero degrees latitude. This is where you see the warmest temperatures in our ocean. And then as you approach the North Pole, temperatures drop. And as you approach the South Pole, temperatures drop as well. So we've talked about that already. And then as far as salinity goes, Remember we talked about those latitudes north and south of the equator, this area where we see high salinity? Those are the evaporation latitudes where evaporation exceeds uh, precipitation. So we have high salinity here and high salinity here north and south of the equator. At the equator, we see a drop off in salinity, right? To a, kind of, of a low over here. What about ocean density? Density is a measure of mass per unit volume. So it's an, a measure of how heavy something is for its size. This determines water's vertical position in the ocean, or any liquid for that matter. If you spill uh, gas uh, in a lake or in an ocean, you'll notice that the gas kind of floats on top of the water, and that's because the density of gasoline is less than, less than that of water. So in the ocean, even though it's kind of like one big ocean that mixes very well, there are many factors that affect the density of seawater. One is salinity, and the other is temperature, and temperature has the greatest influence. So uh, at low latitudes, what we see is very low density seawater at the surface. But as you uh, move down the surface into deeper waters, the density increases rapidly and we refer to this area as the peak decline. And the reason for the density increase is because uh, the water gets colder and colder. Remember, D equals mass over volume. Wow. Okay, so when temperature decreases, when T goes down, right, uh, what happens is that uh, there's shrinkage, right? Things contract when the temperature goes down. So that means uh, the volume goes down, okay, when temperature goes down. And in this case, uh, that would make this fraction larger, right? If you uh, make the volume of water smaller, then this fraction will become larger, and as a result, density would increase. So with colder temperatures, temperature going down, you have density going up, okay? Um, if you have the other uh, effect, if you have temperature going up, kind of like at the surface at low latitudes, temperature goes up, that causes expansion, right? So when you heat something up, uh, it expands, okay? So the volume would increase, and if you make the a denominator larger in this fraction, it'd make the density go down. So things that are hotter, warmer water, uh, will be less dense, okay? All right, at high latitudes, the density of surface water is really high, and there's very little change in density with depth. So let's take a look at that graph. So here we are again. This is depth coming from the surface and going down to deeper depths to about three kilometers. Um, this is the value of density uh, at low latitudes, so close to the equator. So we have very low density water at the surface. And as you go into deeper and deeper waters, the density increases um, just slightly here, but then there's a drastic increase, increase in this area here. So this area here we refer to as the peak nocline. It's essentially the same area as the thermocline because what's occurring here is temperature is dropping. And because temperature drops, then that means density will, will uh, increase. Okay. So they're kind of, the peak nocline and thermocline are very similar layers essentially the same. And then it levels off once you get past a kilometer, okay? At high latitudes, the density, you have high density water at the surface. And as you go into deeper and deeper waters, the density doesn't change. And the reason is because the temperature doesn't change. The temperature remains constant from the surface 
all the way down to the bottom. Uh, so that's why you don't see any changes in density. That's why it's very dangerous. I don't know if you've ever seen those, the deadliest catch show, right? Um, whenever you have a fisherman fall off the boat in one of those shows, uh, it's very dangerous. They can die fairly quickly because the water's so cold, they can get hypothermia. So what this has led to, the, the, the differing masses of water or the, the water in the ocean with differences in density has led to uh, layering in the ocean. So think of the entire ocean as being uh, layered in three, in three distinct layers, okay? There's this surface mix zone. It only makes up 2% of the entire ocean by volume, and it varies in thickness. It kind of disappears uh, right here at the equator, zero degrees, and that's because of upwelling. Uh, but then it thickens uh, right over here at these latitudes, those evaporation latitudes. And then it pinches off when you get to higher latitudes. So the surface mix zone is really the sun-warmed zone. This area of this water mixes very well because it's being pushed by atmospheric winds. And it's very shallow. It's only 300 meters. Below that is the thermocline slash pycnocline layer. We call that the transition zone. It makes up about 18% of the oceans here. And if you see it tapers off at high latitudes, it thickens right at these latitudes and it thins out at the equator, thickens and then thins out when you get to high latitudes. Remember, this is the North Pole or North hemisphere and this is the southern hemisphere and this is the equator so we're looking at an entire ocean basin the transition zone is beneath the surface layer and above the deep zone this is where the thermocline and pycnocline are so we see drastic decreases in temperature and increases in density now the deep zone makes up the rest of uh, the the rest of the ocean this is the largest layer um, most of the time in most areas sunlight never reaches this zone except for at the poles uh, and temperature is just a few degrees above freezing and the temperature at the surface uh, near the poles is the same if you go down to three kilometers so that's really cold and constant high density water all right let's switch gears and move on to ocean life so the marine environment is inhabited by a wide variety of organisms. One gift here, is that a word? Is that a, a verb? Uh, so that's uh, some uh, coral polyps shot in uh, time lapse, which is pretty cool. They kind of come out at night. Um, and most organisms like these coral polyps live within the sunlit surface waters of the ocean because of photosynthesis. That's a way to derive uh, sugar, which is much needed from uh, the sun. Okay. Oh God, I can't. It's hard to write on this. So there are different ways of classifying marine organisms. Um, the first, one of the ways is, is to describe whether or not they swim actively or they just float. Uh, plankton refers to marine organisms that can't actively swim. They just like float in the uh, in the ocean currents and try to stay in the sunlit layers of the ocean. This is uh, these are algae or zooplankton. These are all different types of plankton. This gift shows you kind of microscopic views of them. Uh, some of them those are radiolarian. Uh, the next image, let's see. Um, there's fish larvae. Uh, there's snails. These are different types of plankton. Um, they, uh, phytoplankton or algae, they produce their own food by uh, photosynthesis. All right, so you can think of them as kind of like the grass of the ocean. They kind of float around on the surface of the ocean and they photosynthesize with the sun striking the surface of the ocean. Um, then there are other plankton that don't uh, create their own food. They're not autotrophs. Uh, they essentially have to bump into uh, other organisms like this guy right here. This is uh, really small amphipod and those guys just happen to bump into diatoms or radiolarian or other plankton and eat them so they also float in the upper layers of the ocean where there are algae because they're they're the ones who eat the algae there's also a lot of bacteria that are plankton that live uh, in the sur sunlit surf uh, areas of the ocean and these organisms zooplankton and 
uh, phytoplankton make up the majority of Earth's biomass. And what that means, biomass is a measurement of an organism's mass. So even though these organisms are very tiny, there are billions of them, billions of them all over the surface of the ocean. Remember, the ocean covers about 71% of the Earth's surface, so there are trillions of these organisms just all over the surface of the ocean. And if you were to weigh them all on a scale, and we can estimate that, uh, that would weigh more than all other organisms on Earth. So here are some examples. Uh, these are the phytoplankton, the photosynthesizers. We've got coccolis, which are the smallest. They make their shells out of calcium carbonate, right here. Then there are diatoms. Uh, we, we took a picture of a few of these when we were together uh, using the SEM. That was nice. Uh, diatoms, there's over 6,000 species uh, on Earth. They make their shells out of uh, silica. Okay. Uh, and they're largely responsible for the oxygen that's in our atmosphere. Thank, you can thank them. And then here are some of the dinoflagellates. These guys have like a whip-like tail, typically, and they whip that stuff around. Sometimes their shells are made of cellulose. Other times uh, they're made of silica. Okay, the zooplankton here, these guys um, bump into the autotrophs to eat them. Essentially, they're like the next feeding stage up. Um, we have squid larvae, we've got copepods, uh, snail larvae, which we saw earlier, um, uh, fish larvae, foraminifera, uh, we have uh, the arrow worm, which is right here, and seven is a radiolarian. Um, these guys float around and, and have to eat the autotrophs. All right, then uh, all of the previous organisms are organisms that can't actively swim and choose where they want to go. So nectin are marine organisms that can swim. They're capable of moving independently of ocean currents. The other guys are just go with the flow, woo, right? These guys can can uh, choose where they want to go to different environments to feed or whatever it is they need to do, reproduce. Um, however, they're unable to move through the breadth of the ocean uh, in terms of top to bottom and also huge ocean basins. There are some organisms that make really long treks and uh, migrations, but the ocean is really big. So here are some examples. We've got adult squid, uh, uh, different species of dolphin, uh, coral reef organisms, fish, excuse me, and uh, sharks. Yep, those are all nectonic marine organisms. Then there are benthic marine organisms. Oh my God, this looks like something from a bad dream. All right, that's like crabs. Crabs are an example of uh, a benthic organism. They're bottom dwellers. Uh, and because the, the bottom of the ocean is the most varied, uh, benthic or organisms make up the most species that exist. Uh, in the marine environment. Um, but the majority of benthic organisms live in perpetual darkness. In fact, the sea floor is mostly beneath these uh, sunlit layers of the ocean. So there are a lot of uh, dark areas on the bottom of the ocean where these organisms exist. So we've got uh, brittle stars, sponges and corals, sea urchins, and uh, crabs are all examples of benthic organisms. They can be attached to a substrate, like a rock, or they can kind of free move and crawl around. Those would both be uh, benthic organisms. All right, so here are the different marine life zones. Um, show you the, uh, the different zones here. This is the pelagic area. Okay, here's the continental shelf and the intertidal zone. Uh, in the pelagic area, these are the sunlit layers. We call this the photic zone, all right? Beyond 200 meters down to a kilometer, uh, this is the uh, twilight region where a little bit of diffuse light gets in here, but not enough for photosynthesis. And then beyond that, where there's no light, we refer to it as the aphotic zone. So the photic zone is the, is the area, upper part of the ocean where it's sunlit. This is where we see light is strong, good enough for photosynthesis. And the aphotic zone is completely without light. And that's deep ocean, and no sunlight makes it past uh, about a kilometer. Um, and then there's, uh, in terms of distance from the shore, there's the intertidal zone. This is where land and ocean meet, and they have an overlap. So the tides kind of uh, move up and down in this area. It's sometimes during the day, uh, you'll have uh, inundation, and at low tide, you'll have exposure. Uh, 
The neuritic zone is seaward from the low tide line, uh, the continental shelf out to the shelf break. And the oceanic zone is beyond the continental shelf. So you can go back and look at that image. Then in terms of water depth, the pelagic zone is the open ocean at any depth. Then the benthic zone is any sea bottom surface. Um, and then when you get to the abyssal zone, these are typically at subduction zones. This is a subdivision of the benth benthic zone. This is a deep, extremely high water pressure, low temperature, no sunlight, very little life. And essentially here, the organisms just hope that the tritus material kind of floats down all the way to the bottom of the uh, ocean floor. But there are communities that we didn't know uh, were around that, that were discovered in the 70s called the hydrothermal vent communities. And essentially here, it's crazy. Hydrothermal vents are, are uh, areas where you have circulating hot hydrothermal water from the volcanism. And as it erupts, um, there are uh, uh, sponges that grow on the side of the vents. Um, and in their tissues, they have this bar uh, bacteria that oxidizes sulfur and creates, it's called chemosynthesis, and it creates food that way. So it's like photosynthesis, but it uses the chemicals coming out of these vents to convert that into sugars. And they live in the tissues of these sponges, and then that basically forms an, the, an entire community that can live in perpetual darkness at the bottom of the ocean, which is pretty crazy. So here we go. Here's the aphotic zone. Uh, when you're out beyond the shelf break, you're in the oceanic zone. All right. Here's the intertidal zone. The neuritic is the area that's on the continental shelf. All this is the benthic zone, and then there are subdivisions to that. Here's the abyssal zone, everything we talked about. Ocean productivity is the amount of carbon that is fixed by organisms through photosynthesis. So essentially, uh, photosynthesis is the process of uh, using carbon dioxide and sunlight to create glucose and then excrete oxygen. And glucose is organic matter. So it's a process of using carbon dioxide to create organic matter. So that is what primary productivity is. Uh, on the surface of the ocean, or the most common type of way of synthesizing organic matter is through photosynthesis. And this is by far the most important method and what happens most often. Chemosynthesis is what the that bacteria I was talking about earlier in hydrothermal vent communities do, um, but that is uh, at a much smaller rate. There's just fewer of those communities in comparison to the entire area or all the areas that are sunlit on the ocean surface. And what affects the uh, productivity or primary productivity is the availability of nutrients. Again, these are typically single-celled algae that live on the surface of the ocean. They're the ones that are photosynthesizing. And those blooms only occur if there's sufficient nutrients available on the surface of the ocean. If there are nutrients available, boom, you get huge algal blooms. And when you have huge algal blooms, they start producing or, sy or uh, synthesizing a lot of organic matter. right? So you need two things, nutrients and solar radiation. So most abundant marine life exists where there's a lot of nutrients and good sunlight. Because when you have that, you get those algal blooms, right? A lot of phytoplankton show up. Boom, diatoms, coccoliths, they're all over the place. And that's great because they're the food source for zooplankton. Copepods and krill and fish larvae start feeding on that. And then when you have copepods and krill in an area that are congregating, then all the other marine organisms come in to feed. So you see how it's like a cascade of life uh, once there's the, the, the kind of first level of organisms that uh, like the phytoplankton, then the next level zooplankton, and then the small fish, let's say maybe anchovies or herrings, and then all the other marine organisms come in to feed on those fish. So it's a cascade of life based on the availability of nutrients and good sunlight. Here's a satellite image of uh, our Earth, and areas that are green and yellow are areas of very good productivity. And the reason for this is if, if you're close to land, 
that's good because nutrients are coming off of the land and running off into the ocean because of the weathering of rocks. That provides a lot of nutrients to the ocean itself. Um, then there are areas of upwelling, like the equator. This is where you have water that from deeper areas comes up towards the surface and brings a lot of nutrient water to the surface. That's because of the trade winds blowing in this direction, kind of pushing water away from it. And then areas of upwelling off the coastline. So off the coast of Peru and Chile here is great fishing because there's a lot of upwelling here and here, for example. So productivity in polar oceans is great because um, there are a lot of nutrients in the water. Remember, there's no thermocline layer there or a surface layer there. You just have the deep ocean layer at the surface. So that means a lot of nutrients make it up to the surface. But the problem with polar oceans is that they receive um, during, like, say, the winter time when that whichever pole it is is facing away from the sun, they have lower uh, solar energy um, during that time of the year, and then therefore there's a, 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 a low in photosynthetic productivity. But during the polar summer, they have really high productivity because nutrients are always there, but then this time you have the sun. So when the sun, the solar radiation and nutrients are there together, great productivity, and then cool life like uh, what you see here. So what we see here is the northern pole. Okay, in January, February, that's the winter time. Not much sun, but once the sun starts peaking up and showing up during the summer months here, you see there is a, a peak in the uh, diatom uh, mass. Okay, so these are phytoplankton. Uh, they show up uh, as soon as the summer shows up because that water is nutrient rinse, rich. All they need is sunlight, and then you see a, a, a peak in primary productivity. And then kind of lagged after this is a peak in zooplankton organisms. So after the peak in diatoms, then these organisms start, uh, their populations start hitting peaks because now they're eating all the available diatoms. And whales kind of migrate during these months to the uh, uh, northern pole uh, to feed on the masses of zooplankton. All right, they take advantage. It's like a never ending buffet of food that's there. Now, if we go from the tropical ocean, I mean, the polar oceans to the tropical oceans, tropical oceans are actually uh, have, are not very productive. They've got a lot of sunlight, and that's great, but the problem is, is that they're very nutrient poor. The thermocline is like this mass of low density water that really prevents nutrients from the deep ocean coming up towards the surface. So if we're in the open ocean at tropical areas, a lot of times there's very low productivity. All right, so let's compare the productivity in three different areas. We talked about tropical open ocean productivity. Remember, that remains pretty low throughout the entire year, and that's because of the year-round presence of the thermocline. Then we talked about polar productivity. Remember, it peaks during the summer months, right, because of the abundance of sunlight. But as soon as uh, you approach winter again, uh, the productivity falls drastically, right? So these are those winter months. The last type of ocean that we haven't talked about is mid-latitude oceans. So this is in between, these are polar latitudes. So 60 degrees uh, uh, north and south of the equator. Tropical is like from zero to about 30, okay? And then mid-latitude is 30 to 60 degrees of latitude. And in mid-latitude areas, uh, they're really affected by the seasons, okay? So as you approach the spring, you see a huge uh, uh, peak in primary productivity, and then it kind of dies off in the summer, and then you get a little fall bump in productivity before it dies off into the winter. And we'll talk about in the winter, you have very low productivity. Why? Because the days are short, the sun angle is low, so very little solar radiation. So that's why there's no productivity here, which is a shame because uh, in the wintertime, the water's cold and there are a lot of nutrients on the surface. So nutrients are good. Okay, nutrients up, but no sun. So uh, as when you go from winter to spring, this is when you have the most primary productivity.
you get a spring bloom because what's going on here is all of a sudden the the sun the days are getting longer you're having more direct sunlight and then boom you get a bloom of plankton phytoplankton uh, productivity but the productivity is limited because as the days get warmer and warmer and spring bleeds into summer all of a sudden uh, a thermocline develops so in mid latitude open oceans a thermocline isn't present year round it's seasonal so in the summer a thermocline develops and uh, in the winter it kind of uh, thins and goes away so during the summer when the thermocline develops that cuts off the nutrients from reaching the surface so despite the fact there's that there's a lot of Sun you don't see any primary productivity or algae al algal blooms because there aren't any nutrients at the surface so the phytoplankton population remains pretty low then as you approach fall it gets colder the days get shorter so the thermocline breaks down yay that's great so now nutrients are making it to the surface so uh, you see a small short-lived fall bloom of phytoplankton and the reason why it's short-lived is because now the days are getting shorter and shorter there's less Sun and then that limits the productivity but uh, the highest overall productivity occurs in temperate regions so here again this is uh, everything that happens here are the uh, months in an entire year January to December oh whoops I guess I can't go back <laughs> but essentially what that graph showed you was uh, Sun solar radiation rises up in the summer and then decreases in the winter and the fall then it shows you the um, uh, primary productivity peaking in the spring then declining in the summer non-existent then having another little bloom uh, in the fall then falling out and then it shows you nutrients being available in the winter then decreasing in the spring coming to a low uh, in the summer and then the small little bump uh, towards the fall and increasing in the winter all right and then there's uh, a zooplankton population which kind of lags the uh, primary producing algae population and in fact migrating whales take advantage of this they'll what they'll do is they'll hit up the spring all you eat can, all you can eat buffet in temperate open oceans and then go continue to go north to take take advantage of the summer uh, uh, planktonic bloom in the north uh, in the uh, polar summers and then after they have that all you can eat down there then they go back down south and then take care of the fall bloom the smaller fall bloom in temperate oceans so whales are pretty smart they time their migrations based on the different primary productivities in the open ocean at different latitudes okay so let's talk about some of the ocean feeding relationships um, the main ocean producers the most important are the marine algae uh, then there are plants bacteria and then the archaea like bacteria that lives at the bottom of the ocean all right and when uh, at each each feeding stage only a small percentage of energy is taken in at any level and passed to the next and we refer to these feeding levels as trophic levels so there's chemical energy stored in the mass of ocean algae and that's transferred to every trophic level through each feeding stage and that transfer of energy is very inefficient it's only about two percent so let's check this out uh, for all the energy that the Sun's kind of blasting towards the surface of the ocean only about 2% is converted into through photosynthesis um, by the phytoplankton and then those phytoplankton are eaten by the next uh, trophic level the zooplankton and here the efficiency exchange is a, is a little higher it's about 10% but still very low and then the smaller fish that eat the zooplankton which are right here 10% of that energy is transferred over and then the predatory fish here's a, a yellowfin tuna eating the smaller fish again 10% of that energy is transferred here and then we go fishing woo and we eat that canned tuna and only 10% of that energy is transferred or that biomass is transferred to humans okay so you can kind of see that it's it's almost like a pyramid right and then these guys phytoplankton make up the bottom of the pyramid where most of the biomass is and every other level is oh that's a terrible pyramid all right the last few slides here talk about food chains and food webs a food chain is a sequence of organisms through which energy is transferred we kind of I kind of showed you that in the last uh, PowerPoint 
-hmm. And then the food web, and again, food chain is kind of linear. just shows you those feeding relationships, direct feeding relationships amongst a few different species. Uh, a food web is like the kind of all-encompassing um, connections of all the organisms that uh, kind of eat each other, okay? So let me show you. Uh, this here would be a three-level food chain. You've got diatoms, primary producers, eaten by copepods, which are zooplankton. And then the copepods are eaten by the Newfoundland herring. Okay, so that's those are direct feeding relationships, different trophic levels. One, two, three. Okay, but the North herring doesn't just eat copepods. It eats amphipods, tunicates, uh, uh, calanus, sand eels, arrow worms. So all of these organisms uh, are eaten by the North uh, the North Sea herring. So it really shows a more dynamic view of the inner feeding relationships among different species. And then diatoms are eaten by all of these organisms. Okay, so this is a food web, a more uh, accurate depiction of the, the uh, feeding relationships amongst different ocean organisms.